Hello and welcome to this special edition of Diplomacy Classroom. I'm Lauren Fisher, Director of Programs for the National Museum of American Diplomacy, joined here by my friend, colleague, museum historian, Dr. Allison Mann. Hi, Lauren. So happy to be here and hi to our audience. I feel like this is really special for us to be recording this in the museum in yes. front of our preview exhibit, Diplomacy is Our Mission. It's really nice because, you know, we've been on line for so many years and now here we are in person. Here we are in person. And um, because we are a museum in development, and although we have worked with many groups here in the museum, one must schedule a group tour by going to our website. So visiting audience, feel free to go to our website, diplomacy.state.gov, to, to review how you too can schedule a group to visit the museum. But we thought we would take a moment and offer a little bit of a view of what this uh, exhibit looks like. You can see we have four enclosures, and within each enclosure, we have exhibits that feature stories of diplomats. We want to be able to share with our audience what the work of a diplomat is and the global issues on which they engage. And some of the fe featured uh, issues we have are non-proliferation, health diplomacy, um, and even we've brought in some history, Allison, mm, with um, an exhibit on the Marshall Plan and how development became a very important part in what the State Department does abroad. And some issues, Lauren, um, we can see in foreign policy throughout the years as a constant. And one of those is um, slavery, modern slavery, as well as historical slavery, as um, how diplomacy has combated these issues. And that's really a good way to kind of bring in what we're gonna talk about today. Yes, so December 10th is Human Rights Day. Yes. And so we've really been thinking about how to connect human rights and diplomacy for you, our audience. And human rights, although this is something that diplomats really spend a lot of time working on today, that wasn't always the case. It was not. And in order to kind of give a fulsome look at this, I mean, you can find several examples throughout history. We're only going to touch on a few. Um, but we have to really bring it back to 1776. So I early, know. that early, huh? Yes, that early. Well, and, you know, we got this guy. Thomas Jefferson? Indeed. So <laughs> many of our audience will recognize him as a president of the United States. Um, he was also our first secretary of state and one of the principal architects, author of the Declaration of Independence. So the Declaration of Independence, now I know that was something that is considered a founding document for yes. the United States. So connect the Declaration of Independence to human rights. So when the Declaration was written, and the Continental Congress sent it out to the world. It really was a declaration to the entire um, global community why the United States had to separate from Great Britain and establish its own government. And Jefferson and other authors did this by articulating international law, but they also included human rights in the document. And I think perhaps the most famous words of the Declaration of Independence are, all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And even though the declaration was not a, um, a formulation of government, it was a declaration, these enshrined words have become part of the fabric of American democracy and our values. Yes, but they also have been something that, as you've said, we've grappled with. There's a lot of um, complexity to it. Not everyone who's lived in the United States has felt that those words have been true for them. Exactly. And I mean, even we can talk about Jefferson being the principal author, but himself an enslaver of human beings. And so the United States was born with that paradox right. of having um, deeply held values but who do they apply to? And how do you apply that then to the rest of the world? Right, so you mentioned the formulation of government. Certainly that was our constitution, right? Yes. The constitution laid out our form of government right. and it was the amendments or the Bill of Rights that secured certain personal freedoms. But still, this is not human rights law, correct? Right. And even then, those rights did not apply to everyone living in the United States. There had to be an evolution of that as well. Um, but to your point, early diplomatic practice, and now we're talking about the 19th century, this would be the 1800s, 
These are consuls who go out and really their prime objective is to increase the prosperity of the United States of America. And prosperity is one of the pillars of American democracy. Um, so they're operating in a way of trade deals. You know, they're, they're not really, I don't want to say interfering, but they're not really cognizant of the rights of other citizens of other countries or, you know, the places that they're, they're stationed. So what you're saying is that the U.S. government, even though these consuls were representing the United States abroad, the, they were not given any kind of orders to pay attention to human rights issues. Exactly. And I mean, it wasn't that the United States government wouldn't apply funds to assist in certain levels, but it wasn't part of the policy of the United States. But this will change after the culmination of the American Civil War in 1865. And this is a change in domestic policies that eventually will infiltrate into foreign policy. Um, the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments are added to the Constitution. The 13th outlaws slavery. The 14th guarantees a civil rights and citizenship. And the 15th Amendment is universal male suffrage or voting rights mm -hmm. for all men, mm -hmm. not women yet, <laughs> right? That comes into the 20th century. Mm -hmm. But this is also the time period where we see our first appointed African-American um, chief of mission, and that would be uh, Minister Ebenezer Bassett. And that's a really important part of State Department history is the fact that Ebenezer Bassett, first African-American minister to represent the United States abroad. Absolutely. And um, his, he is posted to Haiti, which is the first free black republic um, in the West. It was established in 1804, but the United States did not establish diplomatic relations with Haiti until 1862 in the midst of the Civil War when Lincoln was thinking about the Emancipation Proclamation. So already you can see that intertwining of domestic policies with foreign policy. But when Bassett and his family, because a lot of times these diplomats would bring their families along, when he arrived in Haiti, he arrived in a terrible uh, domestic situation there. I mean, a civil war, I mean, that had to have been incredibly stressful. Yes. And um, so he's doing his best. But of course, civil wars, as it had done in our own country, caused displacement and a lot of human suffering on the ground. Um, Ebenezer Bassett one day found 3,000 refugees, men, women, and children in his 15-acre compound outside of Port-au-Prince, the capital. 3,000. 3,000. I, I mean, that's, that's a lot of people. It is. They so, were fleeing the violence. Okay. So tell me about who, yeah, who were these refugees? Um, they were citizens of Haiti, and they were not politically aff affiliated, but the, the fighting had drove them from their homes. And to go to a place that essentially is United States territory. They did that seeking refuge because they were afraid of being killed. Wow, okay, so here he's got 3,000 refugees in front of his house. Right. How does he, and I mean, I'm sure this calls up his own experience, as you've mentioned, because he himself lived through the Civil War of the United States. Not only that, but Bassett had been very active in the abolitionist movement. Mm -hmm. He had been born free and worked as a teacher for several years. However, well understood the suffering of not only enslaved African Americans, but African Americans within the United States of America. Mm -hmm. So. Right, or these refugees who have gotten caught in harm's way, Absolutely. so to speak. Absolutely, through so, no fault of their own. And so they're incredibly, he's incredibly empathetic. So when diplomats face a crisis on the ground, Lauren, they've got the immediate, right? But then they've also got to take direction from Washington. And back then, you can't pick up the phone and say, okay, <laughs> what do I do? Like, give me direction, because it's got to go by telegraph, if you have the wires even, to go back to Washington. So he does immediately what he can. He and his wife give them what food and medical supplies they can. But he does inform the Secretary of State back in Washington of the situation. What's he say? Yeah, what do you think he said? Uh help them? Yeah, we would like to think that, right? Like, oh my gosh, yes, give them everything. We're going to send a relief ship immediately. No. Mm -hmm. The Secretary of State says, we are neutral in this conflict. Therefore, you must inform them that our government can really do nothing to help them because we are neutral. And this is also a question that will crop up throughout the decades, is the question mm -hmm. of neutrality. Mm -hmm. And if you help a certain subset of people, are you really neutral? Now, Bassett would argue, absolutely, because they're not political. They are human beings who are caught through no fault of their own in this situation, and I have a moral conscience, and I must help them. So he just goes about his business with assistance, and he takes matters into his own hands. So 
what does he do by taking, I mean, first of all, I would imagine that was a little bit of a risk to yes. take matters into his own hands if the secretary of state or president said we are remaining neutral. Well, he took this as he wasn't defying because they weren't political um, refugees. They were innocent people caught in the crossfire. And so what he did when he saw what was going on in the Civil War, he could see the current president, his regime crumbling. And so he saw the writing on the wall and he knew that the belligerent was going to become the president. When that man became president, Bassett went to him personally and negotiated the safe passage of these refugees back to their homes. Now that's a that's a brave diplomat. You know, it makes me think because when we teach about diplomacy in the museum, we teach about the skills that diplomats use to do their work and to right. accomplish what they're set out to do. Yes. And really what I'm hearing is that not only was he communicating, but he was being innovative. He saw something that needed his attention. He figured out a way to help these refugees even when his own government told him to remain neutral. Absolutely. And by negotiating right. with the then president, uh, that, that takes skill and bravery. And an advocate. Advocacy right. is a, a big part of diplomacy. Absolutely. And these people had no advocate. So he negotiates them, he, he accompanies them to, to safety. He did. And then what? Um, well, you would think that he might have been fired, asked to leave his post, but he was not. Okay. And um, I think it's, you know, really because he did not defy the U.S. government. It's just that his interpretation of what he should do morally yeah. as a representative of the United States yeah. was triumphant. And I think this is something that we're going to return back to in, in these stories is that idea of the morality and what is the what is the right thing to do when it comes to taking care of people. Right. And you'd like to think that this instance would move the needle, right? But okay. no. <laughs> no. Um, we start to see really a change in terms of foreign policy in the 20th century. Okay, so before we move on, I just want our audience to know that on our website, again, you will find more information about Ebenezer Bassett and his experience in Haiti. So feel free, if you're interested, um, to go there and check that out. Yeah, that's great, Lauren, to mention that because we also have a lot of items in our collection that's right. that are related to the skills and tools, and so it's really a wealth of information. Okay, so. So we're hoping that it's moved the needle a little bit, but maybe not so much yet. So you, we're at the top of the 20th century when really war breaks out everywhere, right? Yes, uh, so World War I will break out in 1914. And this will truly be a, a global catastrophe for, for millions of people. And initially the United States will remain neutral. And so when the United States is neutral, when war breaks out, it means that they have their diplomats in countries that are currently at war. They don't always ask them to come home unless they're in danger. And this was the case during World War I. Okay, so, so we still had our diplomats on the ground in Europe as World War I is being mm -hmm. fought. Right. And there, well, we know there's refugees that are, and people that are being displaced as a result of that as well. Yes, or even forced to live in occupied areas. Okay. And that's what was going on in Belgium. Early on in the war, if you think about the geography of Europe, right. Belgium is, is between France and Germany. And the Germanys invaded to get to France through Belgium, right. and they didn't leave. <laughs> because that was where they were going to conduct the war. But for the millions of Belgians living there, they're in a war zone, essentially, because the French are fighting back. And so all supply lines are cut off in terms of food, medicine, you know, everything that you could think of that a population would need. But we have U.S. diplomats in Belgium. We do. We have an embassy. We have an ambassador there. And first and foremost, for the United States, um, national security is at the top of what our diplomats need to take care of. So mm -hmm. part of it is intelligence, right? So they need to be able to report back to Washington what they see happening in this, in this crisis. But secondly, this is when the United States would really actively mobilize their own citizenry on behalf of another. Okay. And much of this work domestically in the United States being done to help the relief for the Belgians was conducted by women. It was American women that got kitchens together, organized relief funds would go out there and demonstrate, and they would um, make sure that they had a part in assisting 
the Belgians overseas. So is this when the American Red Cross gets started? Was the American Red Cross had been started in the 19th century by a woman, Clara Barton, right. for relief efforts. But the role of the Red Cross is going to be crucial here as well in helping to deliver medical supplies. So one would say that the American Red Cross is a non-governmental organization. We call those NGOs, right? right. And NGOs have a mission. Um, in this case, the American Red Cross's mission is to get supplies to those in need. Right. Um, but it is, there is a, a, a collaboration, if you will, um, a relationship between NGOs and our government. Absolutely, because if you think about it, um, a woman's group out in Iowa is gonna have a really hard time getting those supplies that they gathered over to Belgium. Mm -hmm. So they need the United States government to assist them, and oftentimes it is through an NGO. So medical supplies would go to Belgium, food supplies would go, but, but mm -hmm. you wanna make sure that those supplies go into the hands of the people that they're meant for. So how did that happen? How did we make sure these supplies got to those in need? It, it all comes down to the diplomat. Okay. So at this time, Ambassador Brand Whitlock, who had been um, a lawyer back in the Midwest and mayor of Toledo, Ohio, huh. um, before he got involved in democratic politics, and he was appointed to be ambassador by President Woodrow Wilson, he found himself in Belgium when this crisis broke out and immediately sprang into action under very difficult circumstances, bombings. But when those relief supplies would come on neutral ships across the Atlantic, part of Brand Whitlock's job as ambassador was make sure that those supplies were being given to the Belgians, okay. not the German forces that were occupying. So that sounds like a pretty, not only important task, but also complicated because if there's a war going on, you've got to be able to strategically lay out and what that transport's going to look like. Exactly. I would imagine it also requires in Whitlock that commitment to make sure that those supplies got to the people. So he himself, like Bassett, perhaps, he's really empathetic to what these what these people are going through. Well, you know, the United States proclaims itself as a very high moral compass to the mm -hmm. rest of the world during this time period. And one of the reasons why the United States will enter the war in 1917 officially is because of the decision of the Germans to um, uh, practice unrestricted submarine warfare, mm -hmm. and they would blow up passenger ships across the Atlantic, another humanitarian crisis. Right, I mean, a lot of victims. So you this. can see here yeah. that foreign policy and humanitarian issues are being, you know, intertwined, but it's during a crisis, right? So it's not yet gotten to the point where this is the daily work of diplomats. You mentioned Whitlock. He was the ambassador. Um, and for our audience, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the role of the ambassador. Like Ebenezer Bassett, who was the minister or ambassadors, we would sort of call him in modern terms. Um, the ambassador represents the president in that embassy abroad, right? So the ambassador carries with him or her that respect and that diplomats look up to the ambassador for leadership, um, for, for them to be able to carry the diplomats through crisis if that's, the, if that's what's happening. Yes, absolutely. So at the war's conclusion, um, the Belgians uh, gave Brand Whitlock a Medal of Appreciation and we have one of those in our collection that yes. belonged to him personally. There were other ones made, but this one is, was his. Yes, and I can't wait to have it one day displayed in the museum. Yes. To really give this story the highlight that it deserves. Absolutely, it's a good way to tell this story through the object. So, Allison, Whitlock has really provided an example for everyone. Does this change how the U.S. government thinks about humanitarian effort and does it become a part of U.S. foreign policy? I mean, slightly, but this is a time period, too, where Americans will kind of sink into isolation. Hmm. It doesn't mean that they're still not practicing diplomacy around the world. It's just that period in the 1920s where there's a withdrawal. And after the war's over, um, there is this sensibility that there has to be some kind of unity of nations to work towards this ever happening again. And this is the whole idea behind the League of Nations. And this is a, a multilateral organization of member states that would meet regularly, but the United States never signs on to it. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that Woodrow Wilson tried to push in the last years of his presidency, but is unsuccessful. So they will not join that league, but it is the 
the forerunner to the United Nations. But the United Nations comes in 1945. Correct. And the United States is a part of the UN. Yes. So um, what we will see after the 1920s into the 1930s is once again this global conflagration of war that is even a worse magnitude than the First World War. And this is, this is World War II. Right. And not only will it break out in severity in, in Europe, but you can see it in Africa, in Asia particularly, um, with China. And it is, uh, it's, it's stunning. It causes the displacement and suffering of millions and millions and millions of people. And so once again, the United States will declare neutrality in the early years of the war, but can't stay out of it forever. Um, and so the United States will join in 1941. And um, a couple of years later, President Franklin Roosevelt establishes the War Refugee Board. And this is specifically designed to not only do what aid you could, because already they, they know about the Holocaust, they know about the camps, they know about the Nazi persecution and murders. And they are determined that it will not go unheeded or unchecked, but you have the immediate problem of dealing with it during the war. But then they know that when the war is over and they're confident that they'll win the war with their allies, that things can't return to essentially the status quo that it did after the First World War. Well, certainly by Roosevelt creating this U.S. War Refugee Board, I mean, that makes it real. I mean, that is kind of institutionalizing this idea now in bureaucracy, if you will, in government. And so how does that follow through now that the war is concluded, the UN is created, they've recognized that human rights or refugees or that people who are caught during war, how does that come to play out in the UN? After the war is over and the magnitude of the suffering um, is is revealed not only with the Holocaust but also what what goes on in in um, the Far East. It is uh, it's something that the world the world collectively kind of comes together and they they do recognize that there's got to be some kind of global organization to to you know deal with all of this and to just talk amongst each other and the United Nations is created almost astonishingly quickly mm -hmm. after the war is over in 1945 it's the same year so i know we teach a lot about eleanor roosevelt um, she of course was a first lady but she was a a member delegate to the UN. She was very widely recognized as the first lady of the United States, but she also had a very inherent sense of her own mm -hmm. about humanitarian issues. While she was first lady, she unsuccessfully lobbied very hard for her husband to pay attention to an anti-lynching law, a federal anti-lynching law. But Roosevelt knew that he needed the white Southern Democrats to um, support him politically and would not do it. So already going into her diplomatic career, this was first and foremost on her mind because of what she had experienced. She'd also traveled widely mm -hmm. during the war itself, the first lady, first first lady to travel extensively to see for her own eyes. And when she became a delegate to the United Nations, she was very focused on humanitarian issues. Wow, what a powerful voice an advocate for refugees in the UN to have. Absolutely, but yeah. it goes beyond that really. Mm -hmm. And um, she, and also diplomat Dr. Ralph Bunch, will be the principal architects behind the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. And this is codified within the United Nations. Um, there are, I think, 50 member states at the time, and eight of them don't sign on to it right away. Mm -hmm. But today, as you and I sit here talking, Every single one of the 192 member states of the UN have signed on to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Yeah, it's pretty powerful, isn't it? Yes. So, know, looking back from 1869 at the time of Bassett to getting to 1948. And uh, it's interesting because it uses a lot of the same words from the declaration, mm -hmm. that all people are born free. Not all men anymore, right? All people. Right. Um, and also there shall be no slavery. Um, that people have inalienable rights, right? That's direct language from the Declaration of Independence that is used here. So you have those values now yeah. being codified into international law and essentially into foreign policy. Excellent, excellent. I also want to point out that in 1950, 
also a part of the UN, they created the UNHCR, which right. is the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. And this is taking it yet another step further. And what the UNHCR does is define what a refugee G is, and really pulls those ideas from the Declaration of Human Rights that anyone who feels that their life is threatened because of one of their human rights, they cross a border, they leave their country of origin, they cross a border looking for safety or safe haven. And I think too, Lauren, I think you know more about this than I do, but when they get that designation, then they are, so they have to be specifically designated a refugee, That's true. right, by the UN, UN but then they have certain entitlements as a refugee. Right, right, right. right. And I want to say for our viewing audience that a part of the museum's educational program, we have a diplomacy simulation program, which is a, a group exercise that puts a group of students in a hypothetical global crisis, puts students in small groups, they, they represent a point of view or a country in that global crisis. And one of the simulations we have is a migration crisis. And there is a stakeholder in that, that is the UNHCR. And so the students must use their diplomacy skills, work together to come to an agreed upon solution to that crisis. Um, and I think the outcome that students have through that exercise is realizing that these situations are complicated, right? It's just because we want to make sure that everyone has their human rights acknowledged and taken care of, it's not always that simple either. I've seen students really grapple with this and it is a frustrating and often heartbreaking reality yes. um, because w there are many examples throughout the course of diplomatic history where something should have been done. However, geopolitical realities come into the mix and what I'm going to talk about next, I think, is a really good example of that. And that was the Indo-Pakistani War of 1971. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a, a, a huge crisis in South Central Asia. It is, uh, it kind of harkens back to World War II. Um, you know, World War II is such a huge upheaval of not just people, but also um, governments. And um, India was a colonial um, property of the British Empire. And so during the decolonization of this area, the British withdraw from India and India is partitioned. Um, so India in 1947 will be partitioned. And this is when we see the creation of Pakistan. But Pakistan itself is partitioned um, at the time the thought was, well, we'll just look at the religious component of it. So we know that we've got Muslims and we know that we've got the Hindus. So they just did it by majority religions. And so Pakistan is partitioned itself. It's not just one country. There's East Pakistan and there's West Pakistan. And then India is in the yeah. center. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, a setup for a problem, <laughs> okay? And um, that will break out over the course of some wars. But in the 1971 war, it uh, cre creates, again, a, a massive refugee situation. So in 1971, the East Pakistan population will um, declare their independence from Pakistan, and they sought to create an independent nation. Um, and they did so because they felt that they were ignored by West Pakistan. The seat of government um, was really in West Pakistan, the resources, mm -hmm. and they felt like they were not g getting the benefits of belonging to a cohesive country. Therefore, in they wanted to establish independence. And those dissidents um, in what would eventually become Bangladesh were brutally suppressed by the Pakistani army. And as a result of this, 10 million Bengali is, is the largest ethnic population, citizens of East Pakistan will flee into India's border, creating a massive, like your simulation does, a massive refugee crisis. Which sounds horrific, and it's just the impact of something like that is just, you can't even begin to consider just the challenges that a country faces when they receive that many people all at once across a border. Exactly. So what happens? So what, what does the Prime Minister of India do? 
Um, well, first and foremost, um, there's the, the immediate issue of the refugees, but then, of course, there is the, the broader conflict that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. But India is a strong partner of the United States of America, or had been trying to build strong relations. I shouldn't, I don't want to be hyperbolic about that. Um, they were seen as their strategic partner in the area. And um, so the Prime Minister Indira Gandhi will make a personal appeal to the President of the United States, who at this time was Richard Nixon, mm -hmm. writes him a very heartfelt letter explaining why the United States, as the leader of the free world with all of these values, will hold up the Declaration of Independence to be, wow. you know, yeah. isn't this you, people? <laughs> like, isn't this yeah. you? And in her letter to him, she says, the United States of America was formed because it felt that it was oppressed by another country. And this is what you've done. And this is what the people of East Pakistan are attempting to do. And that they are all have inalienable rights. She uses the same words in that letter. Wow, she, she, in a sense, she held up a mirror to Richard Nixon. Indeed. And um, you know, this is where the United States really struggles in terms of its foreign policy, mm -hmm. because it has all these ideas, all these professed values, However, often domestically does not live up to those values, and then internationally as well because of strategic partnerships. So what does Nixon do? Um, Nixon kind of ignores the situation. Um, and uh, they look at Pakistan as a, a, a very good partner in the region because Pakistan had helped broker um, the communication with the People's Republic of China. The United States had not had a relationship since the revolution in 49. And so Pakistan had served as a person to bring them together, a country rather. And so President Nixon was unwilling to inflame the, the Pakistanis in hopes that they could help because this is during the Cold War. And so is not willing to you know, mess up that relationship. So, yeah, and there's, so there's a backdrop to this. I mean, and I think that's something that we really try to explore in the museum and our exhibits, but Absolutely. also in the simulation where, you know, you can't just make a choice for the sake of the choice, that there's there's a ripple effect. And when you, you must look at the relationships between countries within a region. And also, they didn't want to drive them into the arms of the Soviet Union because oh, the United right. States during this period was trying to court everyone away from communist nations. But in the end, India will be triumphant in this as well as the, the East Pakistanis and the independent nation of Bangladesh will be formed. Um, so it does the opposite effect what Nixon was trying to do because then it alienates India. Oh dear. So it's very complicated. And I would imagine Indira Gandhi was not the only one who thought that the United States should come to the aid of the refugees. No. On her and I mean, I think that our audience probably understands this very well, is that just because the United States has a policy doesn't mean that everybody, all the citizens in the United States agree right. with that policy at all. And that's true of our diplomats as well. So Inside um, East Pakistan, we had a consulate. So because Pakistan was bifurcated, um, the embassy was in West Pakistan, but we had a consulate there in Dhaka, which is now the current capital of Bangladesh. And that was there for American citizen services, like processing visas and passports or you know, servicing Americans who were there for travel. Um, these diplomats who were there, who knew the situation very well because they could see it with their own eyes, they wrote um, a telegram to the Secretary of State dissenting, disagreeing with the official policy of the United States of non-involvement, which was a very brave thing to do. Yeah, so I would imagine they thought that they were risking something, right, to go against or to voice their opinion. Well, they didn't know, um, okay. but they felt a moral obligation to do so. And within this telegram, it's stated within there that um, we cannot proclaim to be this moral force in the world if we ignore this particular situation. And then when on to outline the reasons why intervention was necessary on that humanitarian level. Um, I've read The Blood Cable, and what's interesting to me is that he, 
it's almost like they it borrows words from the Declaration of Independence Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Yeah, so that, that's very Absolutely. It's enshrined yes. within us, within Americans. It's enshrined inside of us. And so these diplomats very bravely disagreed respectfully <laughs> with it, but Archer Blood, who was the consul general, essentially the head of the consulate, um, he did not sign it. Mm -hmm. However, he bravely said, I support them. However, I'm the head of this. I don't feel like it's appropriate for me to do so, but I totally agree with them. And um, do with this what you will. Right. Blood and his colleagues wrote the cable. They made a record of it. Right. They sent it to Washington. You can see now that we've got a mechanism for official policy, right? Yeah. And, and a way to um, disagree with that policy. Um, so I'd like to tell you that there was no reprisal from that, but Archer Blood is soon recalled back to Washington and um, he will go work in an HR position mm -hmm. and never becomes an ambassador. So that means a diplomat, if they're working abroad, the White House comes out with a policy with which they disagree for good reason, because of what they observe from the ground. Mm -hmm. They can write they, an official document, put it into the dissent channel and say, I disagree. The president or the secretary of state will read this, consider it perhaps, but nothing will happen to their job. They will continue to work for the State Department. They will. Um, you know, it. There, there's many cases where, um, you know, th that uh, advice was heeded. Um, sometimes maybe maybe they didn't get promoted. You, make no mistake about this. They are sticking out their necks. They really are. Um, and so, but this is a form of democracy. This is one of the ideals that we hold very dear. And we promote that throughout the world. This is part of what our diplomats do. Yeah. Thank you so much for sort of stitching together these stories that help us better understand the evolution of international human rights, right? And how it became a part of the mission of the State Department. Um, I'm sure there are many more stories. I'm sure our audience can Absolutely. think of other examples that bring all of this to light. But I'm really grateful that you have helped to call attention to Human Rights Day, um, that we learn about our history and the State Department's efforts um, in the past, but also certainly currently. And for our listening audience, you know, the State Department itself has evolved along the way as well. Now we have bureaus dedicated to paying attention to human rights crises around the world. We have a Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration, a bureau called Democracy, Human Rights and Labor. We have the US Agency for International Development that is there at times of humanitarian crises, including natural disasters. Um, we have our Oceans, Environment and Scientific Affairs Bureau. Um, so grateful to my colleagues who work in those bureaus as well as around the world that um, keep that moral compass alive, as, as it were, right? To keep, yeah, to keep, keep us honest, right? Keep <laughs> us honest. They communicate back to us here in Washington, D.C. about what's happening around the world. So thanks so much for it sharing It was my that. pleasure, and I look forward to bringing in more groups in the museum I and do too. working on future exhibits. I do as well. And thank you our listening audience for joining us today. Make sure you check out our website, diplomacy.state.gov. Join our mailing list. And of course, check us out on social media at Nomad Museum. Thanks so much.